Now, let's assume that one of the things you're interested in discerning by atten attempting to observe your thoughts is your intentions concerning the thing you're thinking about. We can then deduce that there is a reciprocal or complementary relationship between thinking about something and knowing your intentions concerning the matter. Now, the implication of this reciprocity Sorry. Now, the implication of this reciprocal relationship we've uncovered is not, as Frain suggests, that we can't know them simultaneously, but rather that we can't have definite thoughts about something and definite intentions concerning that thing simultaneously. That is, the point is that there is no determinate fact of the matter about both our thoughts and our intentions concerning the object of our thoughts. What we learn from this is that the very notion of intentionality needs to be reevaluated. We are used to thinking that there are determinate intentional states of mind that exist somewhere in people's brains, and that if we are clever enough, we can perform some kind of measurement by using some kind of brain scan, for example, that would disclose the intentions about some determinate something that exists in a person's mind. But according to Bohr, we shouldn't rely on the metaphysical presuppositions of classical physics, which Bohr claims is the basis for our common sense perception of reality. Rather, what we need to do is attend to the actual experimental conditions that would enable us to measure and make sense of the notion of intentional states of mind. In the absence of such conditions, not only is the notion of an intentional state of mind meaningless, but there is no corresponding determinate fact of the matter. To summarize, the crucial point is not merely that intentional states are inherently unknowable, but that the very nature of intentionality needs to be rethought. Frayn's whole play is structured around the attempt to determine Heisenberg's intention as if there were determinant facts of the matter about them at all times. By contrast, Bohr's point is that the very notion of an intentional state of mind, like all other classical properties, cannot be taken for granted. To speak in a meaningful way about an intentional state of mind, we first need to say what material conditions exist that give it meaning and some definitive sense of existence. But what would it mean to specify such conditions? What, for example, would constitute the appropriate set of material conditions for the complex political, psychological, social, scientific, technological, an economic situation that Heisenberg finds himself in, where matters of race, religion, nationality, ethnicity, sexuality, political beliefs, and mental and physical health are material to Nazi thinking. And this is surely an abbreviated list. And what does material mean? Furthermore, with such a complex set of apparatuses at work, we are led to question whether it makes sense to talk about an intentional state of mind as if it were a property of an individual. Let's return to the play for a brief moment. While Heisenberg struggles to get his point across that he tried desperately to stay in control of the nuclear physics program in Germany and slow down the progress of the development of an atom bomb, Bohr points out that there was an important sense in which he was not in control of the program, but rather the program was controlling him. Nothing was under anyone's control by that time. But if the program is controlling Heisenberg rather than the reverse, what accounts for his intentional states? Whom do they belong to? Is individualism a prerequisite for figuring accountability? 
Are the notions of intentionality and accountability eviscerated? Despite these fundamental challenges to some of our core concepts, according to the historical Bohr, objectivity and accountability need not be renounced. See especially chapters three and four for an in-depth discussion of Bohr's views on objectivity and accountability. In summary, the shift from Heisenberg's interpretation to Bohr's understanding undermines the very premise of the play. Frayn structures the play around the assumption that moral judgments are tied up with questions of an individual's intentions. But in Bohr's account, intentionality cannot be taken for granted. Intentions are not pre-existing, determinate mental states of individual human beings. A sophisticated argument needs to be given here, but this exercise provides an important hint of what a more rigorous analysis may reveal. That attending to the complex material conditions needed to specify intention in a meaningful way prevents us from assuming that intentions are one, pre-existing states of mind, and two, properly assigned to individuals. Perhaps intentionality might better be understood as attributable to a complex network of human and non-human agents, including historically specific sets of material conditions that exceed the traditional notion of the individual. Or perhaps it is less that there is an assemblage of agents than there is an entangled state of agencies. These issues, however, cannot be resolved by reasoning analogically. They require a different kind of analysis. This thought experiment also suggests that moral judgment is not to be based either on actions or on intentions alone. Rather, the very binary between interior and exterior states needs to be rethought, and both internal and external factors, intentionality and history, matter. But this exercise alone does not reveal how they matter and how they stand in relationship to one another. We learn what issues may arise in considering the implications of Bohr's interpretation, but we need a much more careful, detailed, and rigorous analysis to really get a handle on them. For example, questions of causality are surely significant in coming to terms with these important issues but further exploration of Bohr's ideas reveal that the very notion of causality must be reconsidered since the traditional conception, which presents only the binary options of free will and determinism, is flawed. But if causality is reworked, then power needs to be rethought. Power relations cannot be understood as either determining or absent of constraints within a coral that merely limits the free choices of individuals. Agency needs to be rethought. Ethics need to be rethought. Science needs to be rethought. Indeed, taking Bohr's interpretation seriously calls for a reworking of the very terms of the question about the relationship between science and ethics. Even beyond that, it undermines the metaphysics of individualism and calls for a rethinking of the very nature of knowledge and being. It may not be too much of an exaggeration to say that every aspect of how we understand the world, including ourselves, is changed. In summary, this thought experiment only provides us with the briefest glimpse of the momentous changes in our worldview that Bohr's interpretation of quantum physics entails. It gives us some indication of what needs to be rethought, but not a basis for understanding how to rethink the relevant issues. Also, reasoning by analogy can e easily lead one astray. And furthermore, it posits separate categories of items, analyzes one set in terms of the other, and thereby necessarily exclude by its own procedures an exploration of the nature of the relationship between them. Indeed, even Bohr erred in trying to understand the lessons of quantum physics by drawing analogies between physics and biology, or physics and anthropology. Ultimately, 
Bohr was not interested in specifying one-to-one -one correspondences between these components, but in focusing our attention on the conditions for the use of particular concepts so that we do not fall into complacency and take them for granted. But he often lost his way and he was not able to hint at the implications he sensed were implicit in his work. What is needed to develop a rigorous and robust understanding of the implications of Bohr's interpretation of quantum physics is a much more careful, detailed, and thorough analysis of his overall philosophy. In this book, I offer a rigorous examination and elaboration of the implications of Bohr's philosophy physics. Physics and philosophy were one practice for him, not two. I avoid using an analogical methodology. Instead, I carefully identify, examine, explicate, and explore the philosophical issues. I am not interested in drawing analogies between particles and people, the micro and the macro, the scientific and the social, nature and culture. Rather, I am interested in understanding the epistemological and ontological issues that quantum physics forces us to confront, such as the conditions for the possibility of objectivity, the nature of measurement, the nature of nature and meaning making, and the relationship between discursive practices and the material world. I also do not assume that a meaningful answer to the questions about the relationship between science and ethics can be derived from what physics alone tells us about the world. Physics can't be bootstrapped into giving a full account of the social world. It would be wrong to simply assume that people are the analogs of atoms and that societies are mere epiphenomena that can be explained in terms of collective behavior of massive ensembles of individual entities, like little atoms each, or that sociology is reducible to biology, which is reducible to chemistry, which is in turn reducible to physics. Quantum physics undercuts reductionism as a worldview or a universal explanatory framework. Reductionism has a very limited run. What is needed is a reassessment of physical and metaphysical notions that explicitly or implicitly rely on old ideas about the physical world. That is, we need a reassessment of these notions in terms of the best physical theories we currently have. And likewise, we need to bring our best social and political theories to bear in reassessing how we understand social phenomena, including the material practices through which we divide the world into the categories of the social and the natural. What is needed is an analysis that enables us to theorize the social and the natural together, to read our best understandings of the social and natural phenomena through one another in a way that clarifies the relationship between them. To write the matter and meaning into separate categories, to analyze them relative to separate disciplinary technologies and to divide complex phenomena into one balkanized enclave or the other is to elide certain crucial aspects by design. On the other hand, considering them together does not mean forcing them together, collapsing important differences between them or treating them in the same way, but means allowing any integral aspects to emerge by not writing them out before we get started. This book demonstrates how and why we must understand in an integral way the roles of human and non-human, material and discursive, and natural and cultural factors in scientific and other practices. I draw on the insights of some of our best scientific and social theories, including quantum physics, science studies, the philosophy of physics, feminist theory, critical race theory, post-colonial theory, post-Marxist theory, and post-structuralist theory. Based on a diffractive methodological approach, I read insights from these different areas of study through one another. 
My aim in developing such a diffractive methodology in Chapter 2 is to provide a transdisciplinary approach that remains rigorously attentive to important details of specialized argument within a given field in an effort to foster constructive engagement across and a reworking of disciplinary boundaries. In particular, this approach provides important theoretical tools needed to move conversations in science studies, feminist studies, and other interdisciplinary studies beyond the mere acknowledgement that both material and discursive and natural and cultural factors play a role in knowledge production by ex examining how these factors work together and how conceptions of materiality, social practice, nature, and discourse must change to accommodate their mutual involvement. I also show that this method is sufficiently robust to build meaningful conversation between the sciences and other areas of study and to contribute to scientific research. This book contributes to the founding of a new ontology, epistemology and ethics, including a new understanding of the nature of scientific practices. In fact, I show that an empirically accurate understanding of scientific practice, one that is consonant with the latest scientific research, strongly suggests a fundamental inseparability of epistemological, ontological, and ethical considerations. In particular, I propose a gential realism as an epistemological, ontological, ethical framework that provides as understanding of the role of human and non-human, material and discursive and natural and cultural factors in scientific and other social material practices, thereby moving against structure and idealism against materialism. Indeed, the new philosophical framework that I propose entails a rethinking of fundamental concepts that support such binary thinking, including the notions of matter, discourse, causality, agency, power, identity, embodiment, objectivity, space, and time. The starting point for this transdisciplinary engagement is the philosophically rich epistemological framework proposed by the physicist Niels Bohr. I extend and partially revise his philosophical views in critical conversation with current scholarship in science studies, the philosophy of science, physics, and various interdisciplinary approaches that might collectively be called critical social theories, e.g. feminist theory, critical race theory, queer theory, post-colonial theory, post-Marxist theory, and post-structuralist theory. Bohr's philosophy physics is a particularly apt starting point for thinking the natural and social worlds together and gaining some important clues about how to theorize the nature of the relationship between them, since his investigations of quantum physics open up questions not only about the nature of nature, but also about the nature of scientific and other social practices. In particular, Bohr's naturalist commitment to understanding both the nature of nature and the nature of science, according to what our best scientific theories tell us, led him to what he took to be the heart of the lesson of quantum physics. We are part of that nature that we seek to understand. Bohr argues that scientific practices must therefore be understood as interactions among component parts of nature, and that our ability to understand the world hinges on taking account of the fact that our knowledge-making practices are social material enactments that contribute to and are part of the phenomena we describe. Ultimately, however, the far-reaching implications of Bohr's epistemology and his posthumanist insights are cut short by his unexamined humanist commitments and his anti-Copernicanism, as it were, which places the human back at the center of the universe. In particular, Bohr cements human concepts and knowers into the foundations of the ontological relations of knowing. This creates difficulties for developing a coherent interpretation of quantum physics, as well as for examining its larger implications. As I explain in chapter seven, 
While the majority of physicists claim allegiance to the so-called Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics, which is largely based on contributions from Bohr and other members of the Copenhagen circle, physicists and philosophers of physics who are interested in issues in the foundations of quantum physics have expressed discomfort with Bohr's remnant humanism. The distasteful presence of human concepts and human knowledge in the foundations of theory has been a major stumbling block. I imagine that post-structuralist theories and scholars in science studies will also find much to embrace in Bohr's philosophy physics, but there is good reason to believe that they too will balk at his humanism for their own very different reasons. For example, both groups of scholars will most likely find sympathy with Bohr's position that neither the subject nor the objects of knowledge practices can be taken for granted, and that one must inquire into the material specificities of the apparatuses that help constitute objects and subjects. Indeed, post-structuralists would be quick to point out that a commitment to understanding the differential constitution of the human subject does not sit easily with humanism's essentialist conception of the human. On the contrary, humanism takes for granted much of what needs to be investigated. Scholars in science studies have a very different set of concerns. Their disavowal of humanism is based on an interest in the ways in which the human and its others, e.g. including machines and non-human animals, are conceptualized, produced and reworked through scientific and technological practices. Needless to say, they don't have to dig very far to find justification for their rejection of humanism, since the news serves up daily reminders that science and technology are actively remaking the nature of the human. Indeed, the recent convergence of biotechnologies, information technologies, and nanotechnologies reconfigures the human and its others so rapidly that it is already overloading the circuits of the human imagination. At the same time, I will argue that Bohr's insights can be helpful in revealing and explicating difficulties in these other areas of study and in posing possible remedies and directions for revision or further elaboration. In particular, some important post-structuralist science studies and physics insights are also cut short by their own remnant anthropocentrist and representationalist assumptions. Reading these insights through one another can be helpful in deslodging these unwanted remnants, thereby providing more refined tools that can be useful for addressing a host of different interdisciplinary concerns. <laughs>